Continuous measurement is measuring every occurrence of behavior. What type of continuous measurements do we need to know? We need to know frequency, rate, latency, IRT, and duration. This is how you should be studying these questions. Walking through each definition or term and making sure you know each one. The terms and the definitions are going to be your secret to doing great on the exam. If you don't know what continuous measurement is and you don't know what types we have, how can you answer this question? It's going to be very difficult. So knowing what types of continuous measurement we need to know and what types we have is going to give you the answer to this question. Because let's say we need to measure duration. Well, we would need to have some sort of time recording device. What if we needed to measure frequency? We would need to have a counting device. So that's what we're going to be kind of looking for. Now, additionally, be careful because the question is asking for what tool you would use in continuous measurement, except, so it's an except question, meaning three of these we would use in continuous measurement, one we would not. So let's answer the question. Would you use a stopwatch in continuous measurement? Absolutely. If you're measuring duration, IRT, latency, a stopwatch would be a great time recording device. What about a counter on your iPhone? Again, sure. If you need to count for frequency, if you need to count for rate, a counter would be perfect. A partial interval data sheet. Is partial interval recording continuous or discontinuous? Partial interval is going to be discontinuous. Again, the importance of knowing simple terms and definitions. If you know terms and definitions, this question becomes very simple because you immediately know, well, partial interval is not continuous, is discontinuous, I wouldn't use partial interval data sheets for continuous measurement. It's going to be my answer. Very straightforward, right? And then D, counting in your head. You'd probably want to avoid counting in your head whenever possible. You do want something a little more accurate. But counting in your head is still going to be better than using a discontinuous measurement for continuous measurement. Again, stressing the importance, terms, definitions, have to, have to, have to know them. Question two. One of the primary jobs of an RBT is to collect good data. For data to be considered good in ABA, the data needs to be what? Whenever we talk about good data, we're talking about three things. And just remember this, okay? We're talking about three aspects of data. Data needs to be accurate. It needs to be reliable. It needs to be valid. Accurate means you are measuring the right amount. So you're measuring exactly what's occurring. Reliable means you can measure the same amount each time. And then valid means you're measuring the correct behavior. All three of those parts make up good data. So now all we do is go to our answer choices and find the answer. If you attack the questions like this, if you start predicting your answer choices, you now become on the offensive, right? You're not going to each question, approaching each question kind of timidly. We're ready to attack each question. So we know exactly what we're looking for here. So A, collected by a registered behavior technician. Does data need to be collected by an RBT to be good? No, not necessarily. As a BCBA, I might have my parent collect data. They can sometimes collect good data, right? So A is not necessarily true. B, reliable, accurate, and valid. Exactly what we predicted. B looks like our answer. Do we stop there and move on? No, we read all of our answer choices. C, verified by a BCBA. Ideally, you would want your data verified, but even BCBAs make mistakes. And then D, collected by at least three different people. Inter-observer agreement is fantastic, but you don't need necessarily three different people every time you're taking data. The only consistent here to be good data is the data needs to be reliable, accurate, and valid. You receive compliments from your BCBA on your ability to communicate with parents and on your data collection. However, whenever, whenever you are receiving supervision from your BCBA, you become very shy and are unable to communicate effectively with your client's parents. What is most likely occurring? This happens to all of us, right? Across any skill, really. Let's say you are an excellent pianist. You play piano great. Like Now, let's say you start dating someone. And whenever that person comes around, for some reason, you get nervous. You just can't play the piano anymore. Have you lost the ability to play piano? No, right? 
But what's happening? Anytime that person's around, okay, you're reacting to that person. And this can go for anything, right? Imagine when you act one way with your friends. Maybe you curse more, you drink more, you're more outgoing. When you get around, maybe your parents or an authority figure, maybe you're more professional, right? You're reacting to the environment, okay? So in this case, if how you are delivering treatment or how you're communicating with parents is being affected by the presence of your BCBA, and that's the key word, presence, okay? Presence of somebody or something, you are experiencing reactivity. So that's what we're looking for. A, observer drift. Observer drift is when what you're measuring starts to become less accurate, maybe less valid. If you started measuring, let's say, tantruming, and now you're measuring aggression, you're drifting away from what you're supposed to be observing. But that's not what is happening here, right? You're just reacting to the presence of your BCBA. What about treatment drift? Treatment drift is when the fidelity of the treatment starts to slip, so your treatment becomes um, less effective or you start implementing treatment a different way than how you were taught. This happens over time. It's a naturally occurring thing. Again, not the case here. You are simply reacting to what? The presence of your BCBA. So C, reactivity is what we're looking for. Reactivity, your behavior alters in the presence of some sort of stimuli like your BCBA. You're reacting to them. And it's causing you to clam up and become less effective at communicating with your client's parents. D, you know you should not be communicating with parents while your supervisor is present. Excuse me. No, of course not, right? You clearly are good at communicating with parents. You have permission. You just are reacting again to the presence of the BCBA. So what is most likely occurring? Reactivity. Through functional assessments and functional analyses, RBTs and BCBAs are trying to determine why a behavior is occurring or the what. So a behavior occurs for a reason. What do we call that? What is the term we use for a behavior occurring for a reason? Is that the topography? Well, topography is how the behavior looks. Are we concerned about how the behavior looks necessarily in this case? No, we want to know why that behavior is happening. What about magnitude? Magnitude typically represents something like intensity, right? The size of the behavior. Again, not necessarily our focus. We want to know why is that behavior happening? Frequency, are we counting how many times that behavior is occurring? No, we want to know the why. So to answer the question why a behavior is occurring, we identify functions. What are our four functions? Escape, tangible, attention, Automatic sensory. As an RBT in the classroom, you are asked to take baseline data on the number of questions asked during a school day. The school wants to increase how many questions are asked during each hour of class. What type of measurement might be most effective at gathering data and changing the behavior? Slow down. Long question. Don't dive right into the answer choices. Dissect the question first. Spend most of your time on the question, understanding what the question is asking, and the information given, and then we can attack our answers. So what is the question asking? The question wants to know what type of measurement might we use to gather data and change the behavior. We clearly want to increase this behavior. And what behavior do we want to increase? We want to increase how many questions are asked during each hour of class. So what is your first instinct here? Are you going to be taking some sort of time data? Or are you going to be taking some sort of count data. Well, I would take some sort of count data, right? I want to increase my count. If I get five questions in a day, I want to bump that up to 15 questions in a day. So what type of measurement should we use to get to that point? Should we use duration data on how long each question lasts when a question is asked? Are we worried about that? Are we worried about the length of the question right now? No. Maybe in the future, we want better questions. But right now, we're strictly concerned about the amount of questions. Frequency data on the number of questions. Much better. Now we're getting a count. So we're just going to count how many questions we get during the school day. Do we stop there and move on? No. Maybe there's a better answer. Remember, what did the question want to know? The question wants to know right, how many questions are asked during a school day. 
but they really want to increase each hour of class, basically questions per hour. And when we throw that time component into our frequency data, what are we getting? We are now finding rate. So rate's going to be much more effective at increasing this behavior than just a frequency count. If I just gave you, if I just went to you and said, 40 questions were asked yesterday. Does that tell me how long the school day was? How many per hour? No, I just know 40 questions happened yesterday. I don't know what time frame, what time span, anything. If you give me a rate per hour, now we're getting somewhere. Now it's more accurate or not even necessarily more accurate, right? But more specific, I should say. Okay, so rate is typically going to be better than frequency. You don't always need to use rate, but typically rate is going to be more specific than frequency. And in this case, the more specific, the better. And then D, always figure out why the wrong answers are wrong. Latency data on time in between the teacher asking for questions and a question being asked. Are we concerned with that? No, because that's only looking at a single question. We're concerned about all of the questions. Our answer is going to be C. Rate data on the number of questions because rate is more specific. What is one purpose of fading a reinforcement schedule as treatment progresses? You're going to hear the word fade all the time. We fade treatment. We fade prompts. We fade reinforcement. We fade everything. And why do we fade? Why do we fade reinforcement specifically? A, we want to continue teaching the client a skill. That's a extra word. Do we fade reinforcement when we're teaching a skill? Not necessarily. When we're teaching a skill, we want high rates of reinforcement. So when you first start teaching a client a skill, you want them contacting reinforcement at a high rate every time they engage in that skill. Once they start learning that skill and start dis displaying it on a regular basis, then we start fading. So B, we want to strengthen that client's behavior or that skill is much more accurate. When we're teaching, we want high rates of reinforcement. As they learn, we want to continue strengthening the behavior. So we start to fade that schedule. What, that, what might that look like? Well, if we're teaching the client a skill, we might reinforce every two responses. Now we want to strengthen that behavior. So now we're going to reinforce every six responses. That behavior has to continue persisting longer without reinforcement than before. That's how you strengthen behavior. So fading is simply reducing. B looks like our answer. What about C? We want to avoid ratio strain. The opposite fading can lead to ratio strain. If we fade too quickly, if we increase the response requirement too rapidly, they might experience ratio strain. We could see a decrease in responding. And then D, we want to avoid using extinction if possible. Not necessarily true. Extinction is not punishment. There are two different things. We use extinction regularly. So D is just not true. Fading reinforcement typically occurs when we want to strengthen a client's behavior. Another way to describe an FR1 schedule is what? Very basic question. I mean, one of the most basic questions there are. I always say, not every question on the RBT exam is going to be the hardest question you've ever seen. There are a lot of easy questions on the RBT exam, especially if you're prepared. And when you get an easy question, it's your job to not overthink it. It's your job to pick the best answer and move on. So when you see a question like another way to describe an FR1 schedule, you should immediately know the answer. Boom, boom, boom. Move on. So what is an FR1 schedule? Is an FR1 schedule continuous reinforcement? Yes, it is. FR1 schedule, you're reinforcing every response. You're reinforcing continuously. What about B, intermittent reinforcement? Intermittent reinforcement is all other schedules of reinforcement other than continuous. Natural reinforcement occurs in the environment, right? Not necessarily on an FR1 schedule. And then variable reinforcement, of course, is not fixed. It's the opposite. Another way to describe an FR1 schedule is A, continuous reinforcement. Very easy question, very straightforward. Well, jogging through your neighborhood, you see your next door neighbor who waves at you. You wave back and your neighbor says, great day for a jog. You waving is considered what? Be careful. <clears throat> when we're doing behavior questions, first thing we ask ourselves, whose behavior are we looking at? 
Are we looking at our behavior? Or are we looking at the neighbor's behavior? Well, we're clearly looking at our behavior. We're looking at us waving. So let's find that, right? You wave back. What happens right before us waving back? Your neighbor waves at you. What happens right after us waving? Your neighbor says, great day for a jog. So knowing that, let's try to answer the question. You waving is considered what? Is it the consequence of you jogging? Well, no, because you're jogging through your neighborhood. Then you see your next door neighbor. Then they wave, and then you wave back. There are several things in between you jogging and you waving. So it is not the consequence of you jogging. Is it a response to your neighbor waving at you? Well, let's see. You see your next door neighbor. They wave at you. You wave back. Absolutely. You're responding to the antecedent of the neighbor waving at you. B looks like our answer. Do we move on? Nope. We look for the best answer. We continue reading. C, the antecedent to your neighbor saying, great day for a jog. Well, let's see. You wave back. Your neighbor says, great day for a jog. So if we were looking at the neighbor's behavior in this case, that would be the antecedent. The antecedent is you wave, you waving. The neighbor saying, great day for a jog is the response. So the antecedent to your neighbor saying, great day for a jog is you waving back. So if we see D, both B and C, of course, that's what we're going to pick. Kind of a complicated question, right? Not only are we looking at our behavior at first, we then switch and say, okay, how does our behavior relate to the neighbor's behavior? Make sure you understand this question. You have to get the fundamentals down. Punishment, reinforcement, extinction, SDs, MOs have to understand the fundamentals. Okay, Understand why it's a response. Understand why it's an antecedent. Study, study, study the fundamentals. Don't skim thinking it's the easy stuff, quote unquote, and then miss it on the exam. These are the questions that you really should have no trouble with on the exam. Okay. All right, moving on. Ideally, we want our clients to contact what type of reinforcement? What type of reinforcement are we working to teach our clients to contact or to fade to, basically? And when we think about this type of question, think about how skills are maintained in the natural environment. Think about skills you have. Do you have somebody, do you have a therapist following you around all day reinforcing your behavior? No, absolutely not. And neither do our clients. Your behavior is reinforced through the environment. Behaviors that you learned as a kid, even behaviors that you learned as an adult, you don't have someone following you saying nice job every time you engage in behavior. The environment is what's maintaining those behaviors. So knowing that, what type of reinforcement do we want our clients to contact? Do we want our clients to contact continuous reinforcement? Yes, right? But one, Continuous reinforcement in the natural environment is not realistic. Two, if the client always contacts continuous reinforcement, it's going to be very hard to strengthen and maintain that behavior. So what about intermittent reinforcement? Okay, maybe, right? But can we do better? What did we just talk about, right? How is our behavior maintained? Our behavior is maintained through the natural environment. And when we look at natural reinforcement, okay, Natural reinforcement could be continuous in rare circumstances. Typically, natural reinforcement is intermittent. But the best answer here is for ideal reinforcement is natural. We want just the natural living environment to reinforce our client's behavior, meaning they don't need us anymore, right? We worked ourselves out of a job. Now they can live day to day without us walking around reinforcing their behavior. And then primary reinforcers are simply unconditioned reinforcers. Of course, we would want them to contact those, but we also want them to contact secondary as well. So ideally, we would want them to contact natural reinforcement. And then finally, when a stimulus is removed, it is considered what? And when a behavior is increased, it is considered what? So when a stimulus is removed, what do we call that? Is that positive or negative? Of course, that's negative. When we remove something, it's negative. Now, is that true for both punishment and reinforcement? Yes, positive or negative reinforcement, negative punishment. They do different things to the behavior, but in both cases, a stimulus is being removed. And when a behavior is increased, it is what? Is that 
punishment or reinforcement? Well, reinforcement, of course, is increased. So that's what we're looking for. Stimulus remove negative, behavior increase, reinforcement. Where is negative reinforcement? A, positive reinforcement, not what we're looking for. B, negative reinforcement, that is what we're looking for. That is our answer. Positive punishment, okay, that's added and decreased. Negative punishment is removed and decreased. We needed removed, negative, increased reinforcement. Okay, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Any questions, comments, let me know. Check out rbtexamreview.com for the study materials. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.